assalamu alaikum today we are going to continue with the topic of stylistics now as far as uh, we have seen so far we understood stylistics to be an approach where linguistics is used to understand and appreciate literature right so so far uh, we understood a little bit of the themes and terms that are used in stylistics especially rhetoric to philology as in the ambitions of stylistics and stylistics examples this is what um, peter barry seems to focus upon whereas as far as uh, stylistics is concerned then uh, we looked into a few of the definitions of stylistics some and uh, its methodology whether it is a theory or a practice or a theory born out of practice right and its objective features and some its applications some of its applications today right as opposed to the ones um it, it had uh, you know earlier and some of one small example of how linguistic features reveal the meaning of a text and one funny example of it remember let's eat grandmother let's eat grandmother right and some connection between how the stylistics seem to connect it, it, to form a network between language linguistics literature and literary criticism yes and some of the ideas behind linguistics language literary criticism and literature right some of the definitions and uh, understanding also we like to do a very small a short analysis of stylistic analysis of boy of blue this is not something that's given in your book but i happened to come across it um over the internet and it seemed quite apt so that's why i put them put it in here some definitions of the stylistics and the pr principles governing the liter literary approach linguistic approach to stylistics uh, to literature um yes this is where peter barry actually begins to talk about the historical evolution of stylistics how uh, the, the study of rhetorics turned into philology which was uh, rhetorics would be the study where you tend to understand how to structure an argument and make effective use of figures of speech to put forth your argument and and pattern in terms of so uh, pattern in various speech or writing to produce maximum effect that that was the idea that was a study of rhetorics Uh, that was necessary for anyone aspiring for any of these three professions three, three many other professions where you need to interact with the public where we need to interact with people and have convincing arguments with them that's where rhetoric was concerned now this rhetoric once it was divorced from its actual purpose actual ambition it turned into a very dry and mechanical subject called philology now philology is mainly concerned with the understanding of the literary aspect sorry um, language aspects of language aspects of language as in you uh, look observing those aspects of language you tend to um, uh, to to worry about to to um, uh, to research the uh, you know the evolutionary process of language how it it seems to change over a due course of time how they are interconnected with each other how one language is connected with the other and um, and uh, and its origin basically you know its overall origin so this rhetoric to philology well that that was you know, that seemed to be that seemed to be a part of 19th century uh, philological practice it, over time changed into pure linguistics which was mainly concerned with the structure of languages a structure of languages how language is structured now you could also say that structuralism had its basis in this kind of linguistics okay more than the origin or more than philology th this hard linguistics that you happen to come across in the 20th century that's what this was concerned with the uh, structuralism was concerned with and later on post structuralism too dwelt into uh, or uh, rather through structuralism dwelt into uh, this particular path okay so the way the meanings are made and established options available in options available in structuring sentences this is what the the linguists of 20th century were concerned with now with the style of uh, talking about style in a conference especially uh, you know focused upon this particular theme was you could call it uh, the impetus that gave life to stylistics okay so this closing state of uh, statement of R roman jacobson in his lecture of his lecture poetics deals with problems of verbal structure since linguists linguistics is the global science of verbal structure poetics may be regarded as an integral part of linguistics poetics here means the study of literature in general not just poetry this particular statement is the 
uh, could be called as the um, war cry you know a war cry made or, or rather a battle cry uh, uh, of the linguists of the time against those people those critics you know those conventional literary critics who to, for whom you know analyzing literature was not exactly uh, you know uh, was not exactly connected with linguistics okay because to them to understand literature all you need to do is have a sensitive soul to have uh, you know, a sensitized emotions so that you could be able to you would be able to understand literature or speak about literature talk about literature without having to go through specifics so you yeah, remember Massey or all his touchstone method and uh, keats his negative capability or uh, eliot's his um, his dissociation of sensibility remember all of those right writer critics who's who spoke of literature in very abstract and very general terms, in a very abstract notions, right? Uh, they, they could not really pinpoint how to make, uh, like even see for instance, uh, Matthew Arnold talks about Tustron method, how Tustron method is essential or, or crucial to understand, or to um, not understand, but filter good literature from bad literature, right? All you have to do is have some examples, examples of great writers, so that you would, uh, it's, uh, when you come across good writing or any kind of writing, you would be able to, uh, you would be uh, conditioned enough to appreciate a good work, right? But he does not exactly state how to, to uh, you know, except for in, uh, in terms of random passages and lines, he does not say what is so special about those lines or what's so special about those passages, right? A linguist, on the other hand, would be able to pinpoint exactly what is special about uh, Homer's writing or Ovid's writing or Shakespeare's writing or uh, Milton's writing, okay? So that's, that's what happened, right? So there is a, a war began between the uh, linguists and the literary critics so this ongoing war went on for some while some time and later on around 1980s they both came to a compromise and they understood that both literary critics needed linguists and linguists need non-linguists right so uh, this would be, yeah all this would de dealt with the same idea the same problem you could call it so there there is some understanding uh, that later on they arrived at but basically there are some differences between stylistics and new stylistics. Stylistics, while it isolates itself, new stylistics is more, uh, you know, encompassing. It seems to include. It's it's more inclusive, okay. And uh, and while stylistics believe that literary criticism, uh, you know, gives critical comments that uh, that are without any accompanying systematic or uh, even explicit scrutiny of its own methods and assumptions whereas new, new style it's mainly builds bridges builds bridges between literature and uh, you know language once again there is uh, this one problem where you tend to mistake close reading for stylistics. Close reading and stylistics are two very different approaches. While close reading mainly deals with just understanding, or um, you know, uh, oh, uh, one sec. Okay. While um, while close reading is more impressionistic in nature and it's more intuitive and randomized, its stylistic analysis is quite um, objective and scientific and also tends to demystify literature it does not uh, you know as, as well, close reading mystifies you know keeps the mis mystery of a literary work intact whereas stylistics see you uh, what um see a, a thing could be mysterious only when you don't understand it right close reading does that actually even though you read something closely there is an aura of mystery surrounding a text which is not dispelled by close reading whereas in stylistics you actually you know it's like autopsy you cut them to pieces and you try to look at it uh, look at each part objectively okay imagine imagine that you're cutting it into pieces you're cutting a text okay I, I believe there are so many people who actually um are very fond of a particular poem or a particular prose piece or a particular novel right 
so you may admire that person for having created such wonderful writing but actually when you put them to cut them to pieces the whole mystery the whole aura the whole beauty of that work is lost okay in my estimation it's lost but the stylistician tends to do that he demystifies the work of a person of, of you know the demist he demystifies the literary text by actually taking it into pieces and you know uh, pointing out its different facets like a heart in an abstract sense is a uh, is a very strange thing right when you talk about heart okay she is heartless the idea of heart is so abstract but ask a doctor or 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 a heart surgeon he would tell you and just ask him to talk about heart he would pinpoint every single vein going and uh, going in and coming out of uh, you know the vein and artery coming and going in out of it right he, he would talk about uh, it, the, the the parts in the heart the the, ch the chambers in the heart uh, what pumps what kind of blood into it and which carries oxygen what replenishes the body he would talk about it in a very objective and scientific manner that would totally take you out of the realm of abstractedness that we generally really as as you know assigned to the word heart you know in a normal abstract context so the close reading mystifies keeps the mystery intact of a work whereas stylistics analysis it actually removes the mystery it demystifies it okay so considering ambitions of stylistics this is what we were mainly concerned with and it took me quite a bit of time to approach this part um so in ambitions of stylistics what you see is first of all stylisticians try to provide they tend to do three things okay first stylisticians try to provide hard data to support existing intuitions uh, i'm sorry i made a mistake here it's supposed to be intuitions not institutions okay um how about you in remove the s intuitions sorry it's supposed to be in intuitions i'm sorry i should have um, cleared this mistake before i started off recording okay so so stylisticians stylisticians try to provide hard data to support existing intuitions about a literary work straight textual interpretation that is backed up with backs up in impressionistic hunches of common reader see what they tend to do is say for instance you have read a particular poem by say robert frost and you have certain hunches certain impression uh, uh, you know made on you by that poem and this hunch you have you don't really have any you know um, say for instance i have asked you to read uh, some work um, possibly northanger abbey or or maybe sun also rises right so i have asked you to read a work and when i ask you in the class what do you think about the book i get very vague answers well i me in your place would do the same thing i believe so we tend to say no it's good ma'am or it is fine ma'am uh, the book is okay ma'am it's not that good um yeah it's kind of confu confusing i mean that i get only when there is tony morrison concerned is concerned i mean she has a very complex way of uh, you know writing or even um alice walker yeah she too uh, she too is quite a complex writer so there are vague impressions formed in a mind from uh, from uh, watching watching a movie or uh, reading a book or 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 seeing a painting yeah there are vague impressions formed in our minds about each work but then a stylistician would actually back up your impressions with hard evidence okay so for instance if you're saying that um a north anger abbey is really interesting it's good to read he the stylistician would actually point out why it is good okay or why it is juvenile or why it is i mean what is the thing that makes it stand out or what is what is a character like for instance a character of catherine catherine in north anger abbey she seems very childish in the beginning naive in the middle and quite mature towards the end right 
And a stylistician, I mean, I would speak in those abstract terms, but the stylistician would actually pick out dialogues from the beginning, some dialogues from the middle, and some dialogues towards the end. Okay? And he would write them down and compare each dialogue of, of, of Catherine or how, um, how, how um, Jane Austen seems to change the way she's, you know, she writes about uh, Catherine in each, Catherine Morland in each, uh, uh, in each setting or each uh, time, you know, uh, whether she is in, um, at her home or at, um, at, at Fullerton or, or at uh, Bath or at, uh, um, was that place, North Anger Abbey, right? She transforms, she undergoes transformation throughout the novel and that would be presented not in vague terms, but in actuality, he would point out, a stylistician would point out the kind of adjectives that are used, the adverbs that are used, the syntax, the structure of her, of her dialogues that are, that are given to Catherine Morland, how they seem to improve over time, how it seems to change over time, the mannerisms, the, uh, the metaphors or the similes that are employed, the personifications that are used, the allusions she makes, all of these, and uh, I mean, her addiction to books, especially the Gothic novels, uh, it, uh, the stylization would actually pinpoint the time when she comes to realize that Gothic novels are merely novels, that they are just fiction, and they have no bearing on reality. That, uh, that stage, he would actually pinpoint uh, with, with, you know, hard data, hard data from the text itself, okay? Hard data from the text, providing it with some linguistic, you know, um, evidence. So this is what the main ambition of a stylistation is. So I'll remove this and we'll move on to the next set. I believe you've understood this first point. So, yeah, there is another example here. See, Hemingway has a plain style. So the hunch is, see, I told you, uh, see here, hunches, impressionistic hunches of common reader. We are common reader. You and I are common reader and we are not stylisticians, right? So we have a certain hunch that when we read Sun Also Rises, it is a very simple, plain language in which Hemingway writes or for whom the bell stalls or um, fable to arms, all of it, all of it, all, the, all, the, all of his uh, Hemingway's writings are, are very simple. But, you know, a stylistician he would actually provide you evidence saying that 73% of the nouns and verbs used by Hemingway in so-and-so book are without adjectival or adverbial qualification. You get my point? He would say a stylistician would actually pinpoint. They would count the number. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, Sun also rises of Fiesta. He would, uh, the, the, uh, the stylistician would uh, count everything. You know, uh, he, he wouldn't count every single line from the beginning to the end. He would actually take up one particular important passage or maybe one page or a couple of pages, count the number of, you know, nouns and verbs are there and count how many times adjectives and adverbs are used and based on that he would actually provide you hard evidence, hard evidence as in hard data as to the, whether there are enough qualifiers, noun and verb qualifiers, there or not. For example, consider the sentence, uh, he ran into the rain. He ran into the rain. Now, this is one example you can find in Peter Perry's book itself. Okay, he ran into the rain. The qual there are no qualifiers in it. So, it could be he purposefully ran into pouring rain. Okay, purposefully pouring. Now, there, are, there is neither adjective nor adverb, whereas when uh, Hemingway is writing, mainly because he feels that it should be, it is more, um, you know, forcefully conveyed. The idea is more forcefully conveyed when in, uh, in the absence of qualifiers. That is Hemingway's idea. That is Hemingway's style. Whereas, um, uh, say, you know, uh, Chaucerian writing or, or, in, or in Shakespeare's writing, you would find so many adjectives, each one, each verb, each verb backed up with so many adverbs, each noun backed up with so many, excuse me.